segundo día. Menos gente, pero yo intuyo que, que muy interesados en lo que, vamos, en lo que vamos a ver. Yo espero que vayan viniendo más gente a lo largo de, del día de hoy. Bueno, vamos a comenzar con Pedro Alexander García, con una ponencia llamada Rig Hiking, técnicas de post-explotación en Windows. Él es fundador de CSL y, bueno, actualmente se encuentra como director de esta compañía y, y consultor. Un aplauso para él y esperemos que, que nos guste a todos. Yo aprendiendo como, como siempre. ¿Me escuchan? ¿Me oyen? ¿Se escucha bien? ¿Se oye? ¿Se oye? Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por sacar tiempo en un día como hoy, un sábado, para, para venir a, a estas charlas. Eh, la, charla que, uy, la charla que vamos a ver es, eh, es sobre una, una vulnerabilidad que descubrí hacia el año 2015 eh, y luego hicimos unos, unos ajustes sobre la vulnerabilidad y presentamos unos... Eh, algunos productos. Esta charla se ha presentado eh, eh, por prim eh, nuestro primer evento, fue Black Hat. Eh, no somos una, una empresa que participe mucho en eventos. Hasta ahora nuestro primer evento fue Black Hat, donde presentamos esta vulnerabilidad y un módulo que se desarrolló para Metasploit. Eh, nuestro siguiente evento, esto se presentó después en, en Bogotá, luego en Secti en Suecia, luego en Romhub y luego en, en Derby Conti. Eh, bueno, para quienes no lo saben, yo vengo de Colombia. Colombia tiene cosas muy bonitas. Tenemos bonitas mujeres, tenemos café, tenemos un cerro que es hermoso, que se llama Monserrate, pero lo que más define a Bogotá es lo que aquí llaman atascos, y los hay de todo tipo. Tenemos atascos de buses, atascos de taxis, atascos de motos, y todo junto. Esa es como la introducción a, a mi ciudad. <risa> eh, mi nombre es Pedro Alexander García, yo trabajo en el tema de seguridad en Windows a nivel empresarial, temas de directorio activo, seguridad en Azure, eh, Cloud y, y seguridad a nivel de, de banking. Eh, en CCL soy eh, pues el, el director de, de la compañía y me especializo también en, en el tema de, de password crack. Me desempeño como director de la firma y, y nada, pues ya. ya. Eh, eh, esta, esta charla también pues nos colaboró este chico que es un funcionario nuestro, se llama Sebastián, él nos, él, la función de él fue preparar el módulo de Metasploit. Algo que quería agregar era que to, en todas estas charlas de acá, lo que se presentó fue el módulo de Metasploit. Eh, para esta charla, para acá eh, TechAdmin, pues lo que nosotros decidimos fue mostrar cómo se encontró la vulnerabilidad, cuáles son los, 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 los puntos donde se ataca la vulnerabilidad. Acá no se va a mostrar en módulo como tal, lo vamos a ver en, en un video quizás, pero pues vamos a ver es la, la vulnerabilidad en, en sí misma para que así mismo podamos hacer comunidad entre todos. Si alguien tiene algún, alguna cosa adicional para que podamos eh, aportar. Básicamente, ¿qué es el, el rehijacking? El rehijacking es una nueva de técnica de persistencia que afecta a todos los sistemas operativos Windows desde la familia NT. O sea, esto va a ser aplicable sobre Windows 2000, 2003, sobre Windows XP, sobre Windows Vista, sobre Windows 10, sobre Windows 7. Es una forma sigilosa de mantener acceso al sistema operativo una vez... Eh, se ha tenido un acceso inicial y es un método que aprovecha problemas importantes en la integridad en, en diversos componentes del, del sistema operativo. ¿En qué consiste el rehijacking? Eh, básicamente consiste en que podamos eh, asignarle a, una, a un ID de usuario, a un usuario, un ID de otro usuario. <risa> ah, bueno. Listo. 
eh, vamos a, a ver cómo se asignan los privilegios de, de una cuenta a otra, qué pasa con, con las credenciales de la cuenta que secuestra, con la cuenta atacada eh, y demás. ¿Cómo se ve en el sistema operativo? Ante los ojos del sistema operativo, eh, nosotros vamos a vernos como determinada cuenta, no nos vamos a ver en, en los grupos que no debemos estar, pero vamos a tener permisos de, de administración. Eh, bueno, acá está la, la información del, del módulo que, que desarrolló el, el chico que trabaja con nosotros, que desarrolló Sebastián. En Metasploit lo encuentran en Windows, Manage, eh, en Post Windows, Manage, eh, Read Hijack. Y pues nada, toda la, eh, toda la información técnica como tal de, de la vulnerabilidad la pueden encontrar en nuestra página web, en csl.com.com. Están todos los componentes que son afectados en el sistema operativo y todo el detalle técnico y el trasfondo de esto. Eh, las referencias de, de esto, pues es en nuestra página, como, como creadores, como descubridores de la, de la vulnerabilidad y, y en otros sitios de los cuales nos apoyamos en, en algunas cosas. Nuestras redes sociales, arroba 3L Peter y arroba la CSL Peter. Mm. Y listo, hemos terminado. <risa> vamos, a, vamos entonces ahora con, con la parte del, de la demo. Eh, me dicen si, si se ve bien en, en tamaño, si se ve todo, todo bien. ¿Se ve bien? ¿Sí? Listo. Entonces, eh, hay varias formas de administrar, de administrar usuarios en, en la máquina. Entonces, ten, lo podemos administrar por, por línea de comandos y lo podemos administrar por la interfaz de usuario. Por línea de comandos, pues básicamente es con el comando NetUser, donde acá vemos que está la cuenta Administrator, la cuenta Guest y la cuenta I1. Eh, vamos a ver la cuenta Guest. Entonces, vemos que la cuenta Guest no se encuentra activa. Eh, bueno, vamos a editar acá un momento, por favor. No me cuelguen, no me cuelguen. Vemos que la cuenta Guest pues, no se encuentra activa, su contraseña no expira. Eh, tenemos otra, otra cuenta que es el usuario administrator. Eh, vemos que la cuenta no está activa, su contraseña no expira. Y tenemos la cuenta Guest con la que estoy logueado, que es el usuario I1. La cuenta está activa, su contraseña nunca expira y este es el, el perfil del, del usuario como tal. Y acá, ¿quiénes somos nosotros? Y pues acá el sistema operativo nos dice que nosotros somos I1. Si lo miramos por el local user manager, eh, pues básicamente vamos a ver lo mismo. Donde están los usuarios, tenemos la cuenta de administrador, la cuenta de guest y la cuenta de, de I1. Entonces vamos a, a hacer, a, a, digamos la primera inconsistencia que vemos es que eh, para Windows los usuarios, los grupos son usuarios y las identidades de los grupos son usuarios. Entonces, por ejemplo, vamos a, si tratamos de crear un usuario con el nombre Interactive, y coloquémosle acá una contraseña A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, y acá A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. Eh, creamos la cuenta, y el sistema operativo nos dice que la cuenta ya existe. Si intentamos crear una cuenta que se llame Bash, eh, con el password A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, y acá contraseña A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, y la tratamos de crear, el sistema operativo vuelve y nos dice que la cuenta ya existe, pero sin embargo no, no está dentro de los usuarios. Para Windows, los, los, los grupos vienen a ser usuarios también. Entonces vamos a crear, por ejemplo, un grupo que se llame, un usuario que se llame Administrators. Con, la cuen, con el password ABC123 y confirmamos el password ABC123. Y pues el sistema operativo nos dice que la cuenta ya existe. Eh, son varias palabras las que están reservadas como tal, que en la que Windows no nos permite crear usuarios. Eh, esta es, por ejemplo, la cuenta Dialab, que se usaba mucho en los servicios de acceso remoto de, de Windows NT y de Windows 2000. Hoy en día ya casi no se usa, pero pues dentro de la arquitectura del sistema operativo, esta se encuentra. Entonces, nuestra, lo, lo primero que quisimos hacer, bueno, ¿cómo podemos crear en el sistema operativo un usuario que 
¿Cómo podemos usar un, una palabra reservar? Entonces vamos a crear el usuario secadmin y le vamos a asignar de password abc123 y acá abc123. Damos enter, cerramos acá, acá vemos nuestro usuario secadmin, entramos a propiedades y es miembro del grupo de, de usuarios. Eh, por debajo el sistema operativo que está haciendo, entonces lanzamos eh, pcxec menos s menos i cmd.exe, acá lo que estamos haciendo es lanzar eh, una consola de comandos bajo los permisos de, de la cuenta system y acá escribimos regedit, por ser un proceso hijo del otro pues nos va a mostrar los usuarios por acá, por acá tenemos los nombres de usuario, por acá tenemos lo que, lo que el sistema operativo llama el read y lo primero que nosotros vimos pues era que acá sí efectivamente podíamos colocar Dialab, cerrábamos acá, veníamos acá, lo volvemos, cerramos acá, volvemos a lanzar el administrador local de usuarios y pues acá dentro de usuarios el, nos, nos genera un error, no nos muestra la cuenta por este lado, pero por acá sí que nos muestra eh, no, la cuenta creada Dialab. Esa fue como la, la primera inconsistencia que encontramos donde dijimos, bueno, acá, ¿qué más, qué más podríamos encontrar? Entonces volvimos a entrar a la a la consola de, del registro, abrimos el registro, vemos la, la cuenta como tal y dijimos, listo, vamos a borrar el usuario Dialab, a ver qué, qué pasa. Entonces, NetUser, Dialab, slash, del. ¿Qué pasa? Ese nombre de usuario es reservado hasta, el, hasta para el propio sistema operativo. En el momento en que nosotros hacemos el borrado del usuario, el sistema operativo nos borra el read, pero nos conserva el nombre del usuario por este lado. Eh, volvemos a mirar por acá, F5, cerramos acá, volvemos a abrir, eh, cerremos este, LUSR, NGR.NFC. Entramos acá a grupos y pues ya, ahí no. Entonces dijimos, listo, queremos ir un poco más allá. Entonces, en Ma Microsoft siempre nos ha nos ha mostrado que los, el ID 500 pertenece al administrador, el 501 pertenece a la cuenta invitado y el 1000 para arriba arranca las, las cuentas de los usuarios. Entonces vamos a borrar este usuario de Dialab de acá y ya quedamos sin el usuario de Dialab. Perfecto, hasta ahí vamos todos bien, ¿cierto? Listo, entonces dijimos listo, ¿cómo creamos un usuario que el sistema operativo no nos permita borrar? Entonces, el sistema operativo, cuando tú creas el usuario, espera que se cree con el ID de 1000 hacia arriba. Dijimos, bueno, ¿y qué pasa si le asignamos como ID de usuario, no un 500, ni un 501, ni un 1000, sino un 0 o un 1 o, una, o cualquier otra cosa? Entonces, ya está, pues vamos, vamos a hacerlo. Entonces, localusermanager.msc, acá tenemos nuestros usuarios y vamos a crear eh, un usuario que se llame test1 con password abc123 y acá password abc123. Cerramos acá, acá está nuestro usuario test1, en el momento en que venimos al registro, F5, y acá está nuestro usuario test1 que tiene un ID asociado y ese ID asociado está acá. Entonces, si tratamos de editar este ID así, pues no, no se va a poder hacer, entonces lo que hicimos fue file, export, acá exportémoslo a read1, read1, Salvar, file, import, ok. Acá buscamos read 1, clic derecho, editar. Y cambiamos este valor y vamos a ponerle 0. Le decimos cerrar acá, salvar cambios, eh, importamos aquí. Ok por acá, acá ya quedamos con el read nulo. Y, 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 y acá lo que hacemos es renombrar esto a 0. Entonces, 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. Listo. Damos F5, venimos acá a la consola de usuarios, la consola de usuarios está acá. Clic derecho, test 1, eliminar, borrar y el sistema operativo, como tiene un ID diferente, nos dice qué pena, pero esta es una cuenta integrada del sistema operativo, no la puede borrar. Dijimos, ok, entonces cerremos por acá, ensayemos por acá, por este lado, vinimos por acá y dijimos, listo, tenemos permisos de system, entonces... Eh, ¿Quién soy yo? Las old. Eh, uy.
Entonces acá somos System y decimos, ok, vamos a ensayar a hacer lo mismo como System. Eh, Net Users, eh, Net User, Test 1, Slash Del. Y a pesar que seamos System, el sistema operativo tampoco nos la deja borrar. Dijimos, listo, bien, es una, eh, funciona, puede, puede ser. Eh, entonces Net User, Test 1, ABC, 1, 2, 3. Listo. Entonces vamos ahora a cerrar sesión, a iniciar sesión con el usuario System. Acá pues está mi perfil con mi fondo de pantalla, con mis cosas y esperemos que cierre sesión. Cerramos sesión. Entonces nombre de usuario, test 1 y acá ABC123. Entonces el sistema operativo le empieza a crear el perfil del usuario. El usuario ingresa a la máquina. Y nada, pues es un, en este momento es un usuario que no se puede borrar, pero es un usuario que se puede detectar, que se puede ver que, que ahí hay una inconsistencia. Entonces, esperemos un momento, mientras nos crea el perfil, esperamos no sea mucho. Listo, entonces ahora acá, CMD, Enter y se ve bien. Listo. Entonces acá, ¿quién soy yo? Slash all. Y pues vemos que tenemos el ID de usuario 507. Entonces dijimos, pero se supone que lo habíamos cambiado a ID 0. ¿Qué pasó? Entonces volvemos al otro lado. Y nos vamos a dar cuenta que... Eh, el sistema operativo lo que está haciendo es apuntar a la SAM de una forma diferente. Entonces acá arranca mi perfil, arranca mi usuario, este software que arranco cuando arranca la máquina, CMD, clic derecho. Ejecutar como administrador. Ok, PSX, que espacio menos S, espacio menos I, CMD. Entonces, tenemos el usuario test, test 1, que tiene una, un read 0, que este sería el read, y acá tenemos otro read 0, y vemos acá algunas propiedades del, del usuario. Parte de lo que nosotros vimos en, en la investigación, o parte de lo que encontré, es que cuando este número de aquí está activo, eh, es par, la cuenta está activa. Cuando el número es impar, la cuenta está inactiva. Entonces, ahorita está en 10, vamos a ponerlo en 33. Le damos OK. F5 acá. Y acá el usrmgr.nc. Entramos acá. Users, vemos que el usuario está activo, pero cuando le damos doble clic, la cuenta aparece como deshabilitada. Y acá al ver cuando está Net Users, eh, Net User, espacio es 1 y pues acá la cuenta está deshabilitada hay un problema que tiene esta consola de windows como tal y es que no refresca eh, siempre en tiempo real los cambios que, que se están haciendo sobre los usuarios entonces nada listo vinimos acá cogemos el usuario test 1 borramos test 1 eh, corremos cogemos acá este este read lo borramos y ya está. Entonces, eh, ¿qué pasa? Ahí está la cuenta de administrador que está deshabilitada, que apunta hacia este 01F4. Y dentro de toda la SAM, vemos que acá se refleja, es como F401. El, el, el sistema operativo le, le hace el cambio. Y con el 11, pues la cuenta está deshabilitada, número impar deshabilitado, número par habilitado. Entonces, ya teniendo todo esto, dijimos, listo, vamos a crear eh, CLS, vamos a hacer Net User, eh, vamos a hacer PP1. Con password abc123 slash at. Venimos luego para el sistema operativo. Vemos que la cuenta está creada acá. Vemos el usuario pp1 que viene con este ID de usuario como tal. Eh, hacemos clic acá. Y acá vemos que este es el ID de nuestro usuario. Entonces vamos a buscar un usuario que queramos impersonar. El 03E8. Entonces cuando se hace inicio en el sistema operativo... Viene y busca este ID, lo relaciona con el número de usuario y por alguna extraña razón el sistema operativo de todas formas por dentro tiene que volverle a decir el read. Entonces acá es E803, lo que hacemos es tomar el usuario Pepe, buscar el su ID de usuario. 
y cambiamos esto de acá por E803, eh, E803, E803, listo, cerramos acá y acá en es users pp1 y acá es shutdown slash pp1 entonces cerramos sesión y acá pp1 con password abc123 y le damos enter Y ya está. Entonces nos, creó el, nos cargó el usuario, pero nos cargó el perfil de la cuenta que queríamos impersonar. Nos cargó el mismo software que tenía de, de arran teníamos de arranque al otro lado. Y pues vamos a ver qué nos dice el sistema operativo. Entonces, CMD, clic derecho. Eh, uy, CMD, clic derecho. Ejecutar como administrador. Ejecutamos acá como administrador. LUSRMGR.msc. Acá vemos los usuarios, nos genera un error, vemos el usuario Pepe, miembro del grupo de usuarios normal, vemos la cuenta de administrador que está deshabilitada, tenemos el usuario I1, tenemos el grupo administrator, donde están administrators y I1, pero pues Pepe no suena por ningún lado. Sin embargo, eh, acá, ¿quién soy yo? Entonces el sistema nos dice, usted es Pepe1, y al decirle, ¿quién soy yo? Slash all, el sistema nos dice, eh, usted tiene... Eh, rip, rip. pero y estamos impersonando el, el, otro, el otro usuario como tal Listo. entonces vamos ahora a hacer otra prueba Es lo mismo, acá tenemos nuestro usuario, CMD, clic derecho. Ejecutar como administrador. Ok. Y acá, regedit. Ah, perdón, lo siento. PSExe, espacio menos S, espacio menos I, CMD. Acá cargamos nuestro CMD. Entramos como tal a la SAM. Vemos los usuarios y vamos a hacer una última prueba, que es el net user, José, con password José, espacio, espacio, Alex. Venimos acá a la SAM, F5, tenemos a José, 03F1, acá 03F1, y acá cambiamos por eh, F4, 0, 1. Le damos OK, cerramos acá. Users, lusrmgr.msc. Tenemos acá los usuarios, tenemos acá el error. José, y es miembro del, del grupo de usuarios. Entonces, cerramos sesión. El sistema operativo lo mismo, nos vuelve a cargar el perfil, nos vuelve a generar el, el perfil como tal de, de este usuario con que estamos iniciando sesión. Cerramos acá. Y acá, CMD. Ejecutamos CMD. ¿Quién soy yo? Slash all. Y pues básicamente ya tenemos el read de la cuenta administrador y ya está. Eso es el Rihayak.
¿Preguntas? Sí, no es una técnica de escalación de privilegios, es una técnica de persistencia. Gracias. A usted. Buenas tardes. Pregunta sería, solo usuarios locales, ¿no? En H Directory no funcionaría, ¿no? No, esto es solamente para usuarios locales. Para directorio activo no, no lo hemos encontrado aún. Gracias. Gracias a ustedes, chicos. Bueno, ahora vamos a comenzar con Steve Michel, con una presentación llamada Cooking with the Cyber Chef. Es bastante curiosa cuando yo leí lo de Cyber Chef, porque no sabía que, que podía existir algo así. Eh, él nos va a presentar en inglés, lo va a intentar hacer lentito para que todos nos enteremos. Y las preguntas, por favor, yo voy a, voy a pedir que las hagamos en inglés. Si alguien quiere preguntar algo y necesita decirlo en español porque no sabe, vamos a intentar traducirlo. No soy una crack Gracias. traductora, así que bueno, vamos a intentarlo entre, entre todos. He's going to do a presentation about an overview followed by an interactive demonstration of some of the features of CyberChef. The demo will only cover the small part of what can be done with CyberChef. Um, He has 20 years of experience in ET cybersecurity and he affirmed that always is a new challenge, no two days are the same. So, <laughs> applause, <over the board. laughs> welcome. Oh. Hello. Okay, I just, I just need a minute. Okay. Um, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, estoy muy contento de estar aquí con ustedes en la gran ciudad de Sevilla. Sinceras apoyas por mi incapacidad para hablar en español. That's, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little few minutes about myself to give you some context and then talk a little bit about um, CyberChef. So, um, when I went to university, um, a long time ago, there were no personal computers, there was no tablets, no smartphones, Microsoft didn't exist, internet, there was no, if you said to someone, I'm on the internet, people would think, crazy, what is, what is this, it didn't exist, okay? So, um, 
things come a long way. In, in I, I had a career uh, as a, a lecturer, teacher, um, always interested in, in, in computers, and um, I can remember the first time um, it, it wasn't a, a mouse, you know, with the Apple Mac came out 30 years ago, amazing, okay, amazing, because you've got, you can click on things, you've got icons, you've got windows, and you can, you've got menus, and, um, you know, uh, when we go here, and uh, we can see, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, right? It's, you know, this, 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 is, this has been around a long time, 30 years. Um, I can remember about 25 years ago, I had an email account, okay? And the problem was, I had no one else to send emails to. <laughs> and then I, then I lived in America for a year, and I had, a, I had one friend in England, and he had email, and I had email. So every morning, I would come to work like an excited child, look at my mouse, please, is this an email? No, no email, oh, no. Things have changed, right? <laughs> when I go to work now and I open my inbox, I think, oh no, please, no. <laughs> Too many emails. So, some things change, some things stay the same. Um, around about 15 years ago, um, I had a, a career change. Uh, some people say midlife crisis. Do you, do, is that in, do you have that in Spain? I don't think, I think Spanish people are, oh, they do? Okay. I thought it was just Americans and maybe a few, few Brits. But, so I, I, cha I, I moved into, into um, to work into information technology very quickly into security. So I've worked in, in IT security for 15 years, lots of companies, lots of technologies, lots of incidents, um, lots of products that have been sold to lots of companies. They spent huge amounts of money. Uh, if, I, if I worked, if I add up all the, the money that's been spent by all the companies I've worked for, it's billions of euros, okay? And a lot of this has been wasted on products that don't really do anything, okay? I could spend the next two hours having a rant about all this, this waste of money, but that's not the point of this. So, on that point, one of the things that I'm gonna talk about with CyberChef is that it is completely free. So I'm not here to sell you anything. It's, I'm a practitioner, I like tools, I like things that make my life easy, and, and I discovered this product uh, about two years ago, and I use it every day now because it just because of the work I do. I'll talk a bit more about the work I do um, as we go through it, okay? So, um, I've done this in Spanish. Um, so, um, what, what, what is CyberChef? Okay, um, the first thing is it's, it's, it's lots of tools in one place. Um, and I think one of the great advantages of this product is that once you learn the interface, which I have to say is really easy to learn, once you learn the interface, then all the tools are there at your fingertips. Lots and lots of different tools. So um, just as a quick, a quick demo, so you can see that's, that's basically what the, the interface looks like. I'll talk a bit more about that. but. Um, to give an indication of, of how many tools are in there, all of these things. They, they, um, they refer to them as operations, okay? But they're effectively tools, okay? If, if there's anything, if I'm going too quickly, tell me to slow down. If there's any, any questions at any point, don't wait till the end, just, just stop me, okay? Um, so, um, Lots of tools in there. Um, I don't know what they all are, okay? I've, I've, I've spent some time, I'll show you the document I've written. The document is, a, is a basically a guide to CyberChef, and I, it's, I'm, I'm not trying to sell a book or anything. Yeah, I'm, it's, it's, it's available for anyone, for what it's worth. It's about 60 pages with some examples. I'll show some examples. You can take it or leave it. Um, but. Um, 
it, 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 the, the guide came about because people that where I work were asking me, uh, and so I just, I had some time, things were quiet, so I just put everything together into this one document. And, and um, I, still, I still didn't find what all of these things mean, okay? So, it, so it's, a, it's a great collection of tools. Um, now, the background to this tool is that it's, it's released by the UK government um, spy agency. <laughs> Right. Okay, which is not a great start, right? Because uh, <laughs> we don't trust them. <laughs> I don't trust them. <laughs> okay. So, but I, I, um, I was skeptical about this, as a number of people are skeptical about this. Why would, why would GCHQ give something to the community like this? Well, uh, you know, may, maybe, maybe there is something in there, hidden in there, uh, but when I first looked at it, I did, I did the usual thing, played around with it. I had Wireshark running uh, to see, is it, talk, is it talking back to, to GCHQ? No, it, it's not. Most, most, most of the, actually what I need to do, most of the, um, the code that's in there, you'll find somewhere else, okay? Now, here's my Spanish. How do we do juice source? There we go. Okay, I'll come back to that in a minute. So, so if you really want to, it's going to take a minute. If you really want to, you can, you can go and look at the source. It's all there. It's all, it's on GitHub. It's all, it's all open source, right? And some of it was not created by GCHQ. But the important point with this is that when you go to the CyberChef site, you download your copy. And then it stays on your machine. And then whatever you do does not leave your network. So in, in, in organizations where we're really concerned about controlling what leaves our network, you don't have to worry, OK? Because it's, it's, it's staying on your machine. And you can understand in, in organizations like GCHQ and the NSA, very, very little goes in and almost nothing comes out. And so you could see why there would be a demand for this kind of tool. Because as we all know, all, just about everything that you can do on here, there's an online version of something. You want to decode some Base64, there's lots of sites you can decode Base64. Or you can regex, or whatever it is. Whatever you want to convert, whatever you want to deobfuscate in JavaScript, online. But if you work for somewhere where you really don't want to do that, then you've got to have, an, you've got to have a solution that stays on your network, OK? Um, and and th th that's, you know, that's really uh, what it does. Um, it, um, let's have a look. So, you, so there's no risk uh, of, of data loss. Um, and and, and I, th I think, um, I've worked, I've worked in the defense sector um, where we had to deal with APTs, there's that, you know, this kind of, and the very last thing we want to do is we want to let our adversary, who is targeting this organization specifically, right? So there's not going to be anything on virus toll. And we don't want to put anything on virus toll because if we do, the adversary could see they know I. They know I'm attacking them. They know they. They've seen my my product. So, you know, another good reason to keep everything, um, everything low on on the network. Okay. Um, what do what do I mainly use this for? Well, basically for static file analysis. Okay. So, so my job at the moment, I'm in incident response. DFIR, Digital Forensics Incident Response. Um, and we have, working for a huge organization, we have lots of people who are doing security operations around the world. And they follow a process. And that's fine because that deals with the vast majority of the work that comes in. 
but occasionally something will happen and there is no rule book, there is no playbook and there's no process to follow. And the pro or, or the process may say, submit the file to a sandbox, okay? So they submit the file to the sandbox and the sandbox says, no, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to do with this. When we get those kind of situations, then it comes to us. So, so we have to deal with all kinds of unusual file types, file types that you've never heard of. Basically, the way I work is that, um, and I'm sure a lot of people who work in security operations do the same kind of thing. They'll have a green laptop, corporate laptop, locked down, group policy. You can't do anything on there, really, apart from send emails. You know, I will. And then a red laptop. So red laptop, completely separate. I use it. For what it's worth, I use Linux, Ubuntu, because it's easy. And then I install all the tools. And one of the tools I, when I open up my browser on my red laptop, I, you know, a few tabs that open up. We have, a, we have our um, cloud-based private sandbox, virus total, you know, the usual suspects. And CyberShare, I use that. So um, we use that there. Um, and, 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 and the main reason I use it is, is for dropping files in there. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of that. OK. Um, why, why do you use it? So some of the reasons I've put, I've put up on here, um, it's good for anything to do with encoding, decoding, uh, anything to do with hashes. If you, just to give you an idea of, um, if you're interested in hashes, um, again, we'll, I'll go through this in a bit more detail, but if you just put in a hash, you can see all the different things you can do. And that's just with hashes, right? I mean, um, they, love, they love this stuff at GCHQ. They must love hashes. So anything to do with hashes is good. Um, and um, I can think of places where I've been. Um, and for me, um, one, of the first, uh, one of the first things I'm going to do with any file is, is generate a hash, SHA-256. Because in our business, the one thing we love is certainty. And, and a SHA-256 hash, nothing in this life is 100% certain. But if you work out the odds of a SHA-256 hash collision, that's a very big number. Okay, <laughs> That is a big number. It's like you win the lottery uh, this week, and then you win it next week, and you keep winning it every week. It's the same odds. Right, it's enormous, so it's not going to happen, so it's certain. So we like hashes. Um, and you can use it. You, one use case for this, which I have I've encouraged people to do, is just simply just give me the hash, right? And, 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 and I know you can do that lots of other ways, but you, know, you can do it in this tool. So it's, it's useful. OK. Um, I've just put on there, it's, it's a useful. It's for useful addition to the toolkit. Um, and as I mentioned, as I mentioned at the start, it's free, so, so you've got nothing to lose, right? I mean, you can just play around with this thing. It, because, because it basically just runs as a file on your machine, um, you can run it on any operating system, you can, and you can make it as safe as you want to be. You can run it in a virtual machine if you like, if you're really paranoid. I tend to just run it on Linux, and um, it seems to work fine. OK, and the other thing is that it's even got some jokes in there. OK, and I'll, so um, can you see that? Is it, yeah, is that possible? Oh, I don't know if I can zoom in on that. Um, it says mining Bitcoin cash. That's um, true story. <laughs> so um, there was an alert for some malicious, obfuscated JavaScript that had run on someone's endpoint, and the teams, the global teams, was we don't really know what this is. Can you have a look at this JavaScript? So I, I, I got a copy onto my uh, lab machine, and I'm looking at it, and it was horrible. I mean, just just like mangle, I'm playing around with it. 
So I thought, oh, okay, I know what. Maybe I'll just drop it into Cybershare and may see if I can play around with it and find something. And when I dropped it in, <laughs> I'd not seen it before, but maybe my sh machine was running a little bit slower. So it came up with this mining Bitcoin cash, which of course is a joke, but I'm thinking, oh, so, so, so yeah, I'm thinking, don't tell me this is a crypto, this JavaScript is crypto, and I've just, so I'm looking on my, on my Linux laptop, is it, you know, is, is the CPU usage gone up? Has someone, my, has someone compromised my, uh, my security machine? Are they, you know, they, they're now running some kind of Monero miner on my machine? No, of course not. It's just a joke. So you can, you know, you can see, see if you think GCHQ have got a sense of humor. Um, okay. I think I've just made that too big. Right. And just to finish off that bit, um, so that, that, that give, I think I've tried to give you an idea there what you can do, but I think it's also important to know every tool has a limitation and every tool in the guide, I think I, 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 I've put that every tool has to gain our trust. So I've used this for quite a while. It's now gained my trust. I, you know, I, I think it's, it's a reliable tool. But I'm conscious that it has limitations, OK? Um, the most important point with this is that it's not going to do anything that you can't do somewhere else. Um, so if you wanted to say, just show me what the file looks like, I mean, in Linux, I would just run the command, I would just run the more command and just have a look. You can, you can do that in Cybershare if you want to. So, you know, tell me what type of file it is. I'd, I might just run the file command. Or in, in Cybershare, we just run something like um, detect file. Yeah, it's the same thing. So, maybe, maybe for someone who is very, very experienced, has all the tools that they need, they could say to me, okay, well, I don't, I don't really need this. And that's fine, yeah, okay. If, if you're super experienced, you've got all the tools, then, then yeah, probably not. Um, I just find the interface really easy, and I, and I, you know, um, I like things that make my life easy. Okay. What else can't you do? It's not a sandbox, okay? So, um, I mean, I like sandboxes. I mean, I don't know. Do you, are you, have you guys uh, familiar with this, with this one? Anybody? Relatively new uh, sandbox app.any.run. Um, I don't tend to submit files to sandboxes, uh, public sandboxes myself. Sometimes I might put a URL in there. But things like this, hybrid analysis is good. It's a bit slow now. This is relatively new. I recommend that. It's free, right? <laughs> so play around with it. Put, um, have a look at that. Many, many times you're going to get much quicker, better information from a sandbox than you would doing it manually by any means, whether it's with Cyberchef or with some other command line. Because you know, it's a to sandbox tools give you a lot of information very quickly. Cyberchef is not a sandbox. It's static analysis. Um, the one thing I would say um, about sandboxing Dynamic analysis st and static analysis is that you know they should they should work like this, right? They should complement each other because if your attacker knows that you that you're running all your files through a sandbox and they maybe guess what kind of sandbox it is, then they can evade it, right? And I've seen this. Very advanced skills. So they'll make it go to sleep, 
or behave differently in the sandbox than it will when it runs on your corporate environment. So that's where static analysis comes in because they cannot trick static analysis. And the way I like to think about this is, um, what do you call it, in uh, where you have a dead body, okay? Autopsy, right? Static analysis is like an autopsy. The file is dead. It can't lie to you, okay? They can, they can, the attacker can, um, they can pack a binary file and make life difficult. They can obfuscate code, they can encrypt code, but they can't make it behave differently because when it's static, you are in charge, okay? You may have to do a lot of work. So, you know, so the ideal, the ideal situation, the, the place I like to be when I'm doing analysis is the sandbox says one thing, static analysis says the same thing. For me, I can, I can sleep easily. That, that, you know, when those two things are telling me something different, then I got a problem, right? Especially, especially if the sandbox says, nah, nah, nothing to worry about. And then you look at it statically and it's like, hmm, that doesn't look right. That's when, we, that's when we've got a problem. So, um, it's, not, it's not a sandbox. It's not going to unpack binary files. It's, it's certainly not going to crack any hashes. Okay, so um, the one I like, uh, let's just have a look. Crack station, yeah. So something like this. Um, if you've got an MD5 hash in there, I think it's got something like 100 and, what, what does it say? 15 billion hashes. So you're going to have to, so are you giving anything away by putting the hash in something like this? Probably not. You're not submitting a file, it's just a hash, right? So what, you know, what? Um, but, but, but certainly CyberChef is not going to crack your hashes. Um, it's, it's, and it's, and it's, um, it won't detect steganography either. Uh, but then again, if you've got reasonably good steganography, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a source of some debate. I don't think anything is going to detect that, right? It's just too difficult. So, okay, conscious of time, let's have a look at um, the interface. So when you download um, CyberChef, uh, let's have a look. This is let's put that full screen. This is pretty much what you get. Okay. And and the metaphor is is pretty simple. It, it, they they use this cooking metaphor. So the idea is that your recipe is here, the ingredients or input is here, and then whatever the output appears in this, in this frame. So, um, I don't know, let's have a look. Normally what I like to do in this kind of demonstration is I take some files that are malicious that pretending to be one thing, but actually are something else, and I drop them in there. Uh, the problem I've got is that, with this being a Windows machine, <laughs> it kind of stops all that. <laughs> stops all the fun. Where's the fun in that? Um, so I, I don't think it's going to let me, I don't know, um, do anything. But just to give an example, um, what you can do is take a file and just drop it in there, right? And I tend, the one thing I tend to use a lot with CyberChef is this button here. So that gives me the full, um, that gives me the full picture uh, of what's going on. Um, it's just as simple as that, really. You take.
Okay. One, two. Okay. I don't know. Okay. It was deliberate to wake everyone up. Okay. Um, let's another example here. You just drag and drop in there. And <clears throat> again. It, it depends. It depends on, on the work that you do. In incident response, um, time is important. Okay, we need we need to get answers quickly, uh, and and that's one of the things why I like this. Um, you can see in this example here, I just dropped this what dot PDF. Now, without doing anything whatsoever in the output pane at the bottom here, um, I already know that that is a PDF. Uh, one of the examples that I brought was actually a, uh, a bit of malware. And when you drop it in the input pane, you can see that it's not a PDF straight away. So straight away, without doing anything, you have some, you're starting to get some answers. Um, and you can see great thing with PDFs, right, is that you, they are um, pretty easy to read, and you can see that there's some, there's a, there's some kind of stream in there. Now, um, with, with larger file types, um, so I don't know what, exactly what the size is, it will not show you the full thing, but you, you, can, um, you can do that. You can see the whole file. Um, So, let's go to an example. Now, in the guide, there's a PDF version of it. I've gone through a lot of the basic things that you can do there. Um, you can see there's, there's probably, I don't know, 60 or so. Um, So you can you can drag and drop, or you can you can just input the text, and then if you want to, you can um, it'll be, it'll base sixty four decode. So so the point here is is what we what we're demonstrating is. On this side here are all the different operations. When you, when you want to use them, you either drag and drop or double click. And that, in this here, it becomes operational. And you'll see down at the bottom there, you can, they use the, they're using the, the, the cooking metaphor to bake. You can turn that off. Um, And there's no limit, really, to, to what you can do in terms of those operations. Right. All right. So we think we've only got about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to... So you find. Why is it done? Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's, there's something. Up there. This could be a Windows thing. Copy and paste. Um, okay. 
I'll just demonstrate it on here. Um, in August of this year, they, they brought out a new feature with this automatic, enc automatic detection of encoding. So I don't know. OK, let's demonstrate this another way. Um, so if I go, and then we do, I don't know, some kind of, I said base 64. Um, you see here this um, magic wand appears. So, so I don't really know how that works, in all honesty, but there's, it's doing some check-in, some regex check-in, um, some rule-based check-in. Does it fit with any of the known uh, formats for encoding? And if it does, then it's going to give you that uh, magic wand to say, hey, I think if we, if we were to drop that in there, see if we, so we can move output to input, uh, just get rid of that. If we happen to just find that somewhere, Let's say, for example, you were looking through some proxy traffic, and you could see a domain, and then a URI, and you're thinking, hmm, what is that URI? Is that beaconing? Is it, what, what is it? Um, if you were to drop it in here, um, and you run the, it, it does it for you. So. Lots of, so that's, that's, that's relatively new. Um, OK. It doesn't always, doesn't always work it out. There's an example there where it doesn't work it out. Um, I think there are um, lots of examples here. Um, which, okay, actually, just, I'm just going to do one more thing and then we'll, we'll, we'll see if there's any questions. Um, one, of the, one of the good things that you can do is that if you find, um, if you find that you're doing something which is fairly complicated, so multiple steps in your recipe, uh, you can actually save that. Um, and um, then if, it, if you find the same, you're faced with the same problem, you can just load the recipe. And you can see there, um, it will run through each step. You can, you can step through it, or you can just go through the whole thing. Um, in, in, in the guide, there are some examples where we've been deobfuscating things like Emotet. Malware, um, you know, some of the trick bot, um, it's just commodity malware, right? But it's it's interesting. It's interesting to just to just take that pit to pieces, um, and some of the more targeted stuff like um, uh, the work of the North Koreans. There's some there's some examples in the guide there. Um, so lots lots you can do. Um, is there? Anything, any questions about anything that, um, that I've said or anything, any, any kind of comments or anything? Um, yeah. My name is Cher. So, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so the app, yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're almost like a plant in the audience. Well done, that man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, when you, when you get something that drops in the output, um, let's say, uh, let's say I drop something in here, and uh, we get rid of that because that's not going to confuse things. If you if you come to find something that you're really interested in, this is a it's not very good with dot docs, but you can. You can output that to a file, um, and then, and then um, you can save that on your machine. You can do whatever you want. Um, 
you can also export the, the recipe as well. Um, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Um, I forgot that. Yeah, you can, I mean, you, it, so, so this is a tool that works both ways, right? I mean, everything, primarily what we are doing as security analysts is trying to deobfuscate uh, or, 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 or uh, de, uh, you know, um, reverse engineer what the attacker has done. But everything that you do can be the reverse has done. So you could use this to create your own encryption code, send it to your friend. No one in the world else will be able to. Um, in fact, in one of the examples in the, in the guide, I think I just did uh, exactly what you're saying. Something like, yeah, there, I just want to encrypt something. OK? And um, you create your own um, key, and then you encrypt it, and unless someone's got that key, they're never going to crack it, right? OK. Um, so yeah, you could use it for that. Um, any, anybody else? Any, any other questions? Um, OK. In which case, um, just, just, uh, I'll just, just make sure I'm not. In summary, to finish, um, I would say as a, the, the, the one thing that I really like most of all about this tool, I mean, I use lots of tools, but the one thing is, is in particular for learning about all different aspects of, of cybersecurity, um, it's a great way to learn because it's safe. You can run it in an environment. And I, and I think if I was, you know, if I was teaching uh, beginners, children, how to, how to do this stuff, kids would love this because they don't care about making mistakes, right? Just drop some files in there and see what it does. What does that, you know, what does that PDF actually really look like? What does a binary file look like? Um, what do any of these things look like? You can, you know, a docx is actually just a zip, right? It's just a, zip, a whole zipped load of XML. Is that what you're expecting? You know, it's that's the real strength, I think. So, um, not uh, you know, not kind of uh, gonna gonna change the world, but just a really nice way to make your life easy and to learn new things. I think. A any thoughts or anybody else? Uh, did. No, is, 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 uh, one question, please. Yeah, sure. Sorry. <laughs> OK. I would love to see a more complex sample, because until now, you have just show base 64. So mm. yeah, yeah. I think that your tool is very interesting, but I would like to see something more complex. Thank and, you. And yeah, this, so um, in the guide, um, there aren't, to be fair, there aren't um, too many uh, complex examples. Are you familiar with Cobalt Strike? No. OK, uh, there's an example there of how, how to, um, how we'd go about um, the obfuscating that. <laughs> the big mistake I made when I came here was I have a, I have a laptop, um, a red laptop with, with all the recipes in there. And for, Without going into detail, I didn't bring it. I thought, no, I'll just bring the USB, the presentation. So, um, so it's yeah, it's um, I don't have all the recipes loaded, and it would take some time for me to remember and just put this down. But you can you can see um, the complexity is really just lots of simple things put together. Okay, so you take something. Um, you, maybe you base 64 decode it and then raw inflate it and then maybe remove some 
remove some bits and pieces. And then there's, there's quite, a nice, and quite a nice feature in there that I use a lot, which is um, it's got some, this one, um, which will, whatever you've got in the, imp, the it will make it, it will just format your, your code and give you a nice, easy way to look at it. Again, an advantage, I think, over just, just doing more in Linux because it, it doesn't look great, whereas this will, you know. And again, you can take your code and you can, if it's JavaScript, you can submit it to JS Beautify online. But again, that's, that's data leaving your network. So. But yeah, I mean, um, if you, I've noticed that people are starting to uh, put their uh, CyberChef recipes on Twitter and places like that. Um, if you just, just search for CyberChef on Twitter and you'll see there are some people who are putting their stuff on there. So it, it's, um, it's as complex as you want it to be. Can you implement loops uh, yes. and iteration and this kind of thing? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You can do that. Um, so there's a section which, again, I don't, um, here. Um, the, one, the one that I have used is the, uh, the fork instruction. So what you can do is, is, is if you've got a sequence and you want to run the same operation on each item, you can just break it out and then just, just do that. So you can, you know, this, it's, and if, yeah, you could, you could take it to the level of like basic coding, really, if you want to. And from a technological point of view, everything is implemented in JavaScript? I think most of it is, yeah. So basic, Wonderful. yeah, sort of, I mean, it's, it's client-side web scripting, right? JavaScript. Yeah. And you can do a lot in JavaScript. I'm not an expert on JavaScript. I'm not really an expert on anything, but, but you know, it's, uh, you, can, you can do that. Yeah. Anybody? Have questions? In which case, thank you very much. Thank you. Much, muchas gracias. Bueno, ahora tenemos una, una merienda justo aquí en el catering de aquí al lado, así que tenemos hasta las cinco y media. Sí, nos vemos en un ratito. Gracias. ¿Sí?